Thank you for coming today for this uh, commemoration of the 70th anniversary of Israel's founding and the issues uh, that have um, occurred and risen uh, there over these seven decades. Uh, the events of 1948 are celebrated as Israeli independence and lamented as the Palestinian Nakba. The date is a reminder of the array of narratives on this history and the untold interpretations of the social and political convolutions. Just as substantial are the constant weighty questions regarding the future directions that can be taken by these two peoples. These two panels uh, today will bring together Israelis, Palestinians, and Americans to discuss and debate the history, the politics, and the current critical moment, which holds equal portions of hope and despair. So we will have two panels today. Um, there will be a 10 to 15 minute break, depending on how long the Q&A goes on the first panel uh, between the two. And I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for, to, for the first panel at this point. And then uh, before I do that, though, I do want to remind you that we have one more scheduled star forum for this uh, semester. And that is next, uh, a week from Thursday, May 3rd, <clears throat> at 5.30 p.m. in this same theater uh, when we'll welcome uh, Luis Vidaguerre Caso, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Should be quite interesting. He's a uh, economics PhD from MIT. So that's May 3rd. But today, um, the... Israeli-Palestinian conundrum. Eve Spangler will moderate this session. She is associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Boston College. She works within public sociology using scholarly methods to contribute to the struggle for social justice. She has a long list here of accomplishments and involvements, which I won't uh, go into right now, but I do wish to mention her book, Understanding Israel-Palestine, which is published by Brill. So without further ado, Eve Spengler. Thank you very much. The mic is working. Everybody can hear. OK. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my thanks to Anat Boletsky for the inspiration for this conference and to John for hosting it at MIT. We have a wonderful panel. They're going to go in the order that they were in the poster. Um, so let me just very briefly introduce them because you want to hear from them and not from me. Uh, they represent uh, a number of points of view. Uh, we're opening uh, with arguably the most distinguished Palestinian historian. We're going to be looking uh, to an American historian to fill in the background of negotiations around the formation of Israel and America's relationship to it. And we're closing with uh, an expert on security studies, uh, presumably from a global point of view. Um, let me start with Salim Tamari, who is truly a global professor of sociology emeritus at Birzeit University, a research associate at the Institute for Palestine Studies, uh, the editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly. His PhD is from Manchester University, and he's visited at uh, Kafoskari University in Venice, at Georgetown, at NYU, at Cornell, at Chicago, Harvard, and Columbia. So MIT next, Salim. Um, his recent publications include uh, Mountain Against the Sea, uh, A Conflicted Modernity, The Storyteller of Jerusalem, uh, Year of the Locust, uh, The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, and forthcoming Landed Property and public endowments in Jerusalem. Um, he is certainly the definitive wo wo voice in Jerusalem scholarship. Uh, next, we'll have Irene Genzier, who is uh, an emeritus professor uh, in political science at BU, 
a research affiliate here at MIT Center for International Studies and uh, an affiliate at the Center for Middle East Studies at Harvard. Um, so she's done the impossible of reconciling MIT and Harvard, so uh, great things coming from her. Uh, she has written on problems uh, in the development of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, uh, primarily dying to forget uh, her uh, story of the uh, earliest relationships between the United States uh, and Israel at Israel's foundation in Columbia University Press and just out in paperback. And also, she's the author of Development Against Democracy and Notes from a Minefield, United States Intervention in Lebanon and the Middle East. She is a lady for our times. Um, and finally, we have Stephen Van Evra, uh, the Ford International Professor in the MIT Political Science Department. Uh, and he works in many areas of international relations, causes and prevention of war, US foreign policy, US security policy, and US intervention in third world um, situations partic with particular focus on the Middle East. Um, and he is currently the chair of the Tobin Project uh, on National Security, the author of Causes of War in Cornell Press, How to Make America Safe, uh, and um, many articles in Middle East policy. So we have a really distinguished panel. We're going to hold up on questions uh, until all three have spoken. And then in acknowledging uh, questions from the audience, I'm going to try to be a little bit ageist and take students first, although I can't see all the way to the back of the room, and then uh, guests of MIT. Uh, so let me, having said all of that too much, uh, turn it over to Salim Tamari. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for uh, Anat Bilensky for organizing this um, conference and to John Thurman for uh, co-organizing it on behalf of the Center for International Affairs. And thanks, Eva, for your very generous uh, introduction. Luckily, the first panel deals with the past history and the afternoon panel would lead to the future, so we have the easier task <laughs> since we can't be all wrong in interpreting what happened, although we could be. <laughs> um, this year, uh, 2018, is the year of commemorations and anniversaries. Commemoration and anniversary, depending which side of the barricades you are standing. It's the 100th uh, year uh, anniversary of the end of the Great War and the partition of the whole Middle East into colonial states after the Sykes-Picot Agreement, in which the French and the British uh, began to dismember uh, greater Syria and Iraq into client states and also the year for the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, which promised the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine for the Zionist movement. It's also the 70th year of the partition plan of 1947, the civil war in Palestine, the creation of the Jewish state, and significantly, which is something I would like to talk about briefly, the proposal for the creation of a corpus separatum in the city of Jerusalem in which a binational arrangement would have been conceived at the time as creating a middle ground between the proposed Jewish state and Arab state. Of course, that never happened, but it was very much uh, in the shadows of the successive negotiations uh, following the Madrid Peace Conference uh, in 1992, 91-92, and the whole debate about the future of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's also the seventh anniversary of the Nakba, and uh, the, what the Israelis call the Israeli War of Independence, which is the other side of the same coin. And in June, which is coming very close, it will be the 50th year of the June War, uh, which the Israelis call the Six-Day War, and the 
coming of the controversial Security Council Resolution 242, which called for withdrawal uh, in return for peace from all occupied territories. Now, with all these commemorations, we have to remember that the context of this year's commemoration or celebration in the case of Israel is very different because in many ways it brings us back to the dark days of the Great War of, 19, uh, of the 1914-1918 Great War when a huge devastation happened to the Middle East and uh, echoing the current uh, devastation that has invaded the whole area beginning with the Iraqi war, the Syrian uh, uh, predicament, and the Yemeni war, which is still going on. And it's not by accident that two years ago, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, stood up in the ruins of Raqqa and said, uh, this is the end of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And he was uh, recalling the fateful days when the British and the French conspired to uh, create zones of influence on the debris or on the corpse of the defeated uh, Ottoman Empire. And today we see both the defeat not only of the Sykes-Picot Agreement but of ISIS and the creation of new enclaves within Syria, which dismembered greater Syria even further into the current uh, 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 contestations, which is being fought by proxies of Russia, the US, uh, Turkey, Iran, and so on. So where does that leave the Arab-Israeli conflict? Uh, there's no question that Israel is dwelling in a relaxed situation, not only because of the uh, declaration by President Trump about the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem, but also because of the great uh, devastation that's taking place in the Middle East and overshadowing uh, the consequences of the so-called peace process, the fact that the decline of the fate in the Palestinians uh, following the, the collapse of the um, uh, Oslo Agreement uh, was again overshadowed by what's happening in Syria. And what's happening in Syria has greatly lifted a great deal of pressure on Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories to intensify the settlements that it had begun in 1968 after occupation and uh, created conditions of refugeehood which made the Palestinian uh, condition uh, part of the uh, background uh, happening 70 years ago and no longer a pressing issue in the context of the much larger population devastation, urban devastation, and segment, segmentation of the territories. So I will return to this idea in a moment, but before that I want to share with you I wrote to a friend of mine in Jerusalem that in MIT we're having an event uh, commemorating 70 years of Nakba and 70 years of the Declaration of Israel. And she wrote to me back, she said, I want to share my thoughts with you on this occasion. And this is the thoughts of uh, my friend Sami Khouri on this event. She says, I hope you don't mind, this is just one, one page. Um, congratulating Israel on its 70th Independence Day. Surely you should be proud of your achievement. You're established, you established your state on land that belongs to the Palestinians. You were not satisfied to share them 
with them their land. So you had to evict them to have your own Jewish state. You did that by reporting to brutal force, and in some cases, massacres that remain a black spot on your history. For the first 18 years, you imposed strict military rule in the country, which controlled every aspect of the lives of the original owners of the land, who managed to stay in the newly established state. You gave the indigenous Palestinian population citizenship, but they did not have the same rights that the Jewish community had. Neither did their towns or schools have the same privileges and budgets. Moreover, by some absurd law, this Palestinian population ended up being present absent, meaning that they were absent as far as their right to claim their homes and property, but were present for paying taxes to the newly established state. For the last 50 years, you have been occupying the rest of the Palestinian land which you did not succeed in conquering in 1948. You claim you are not occupying the land, but that you have liberated it. And you claim that Jerusalem is the united eternal capital of Israel yet. The residents of the West Bank and Gaza have no access to Jerusalem, except for certain purposes and on certain occasions. We have to be reminded of these things. The residents of Jerusalem are not citizens, and their residency can be revoked any time under a variety of absurd regulations. The residents of Jerusalem are deprived of having their spouses join them should they be from the West Bank without going through the endless procedure of family reunification, which is mostly denied even after many years of marriage. It takes forever and sometimes never for a Jerusalem residence to get a building permit whereas the Jewish settlements have encroached on most of the Jerusalem and West Bank land. So demolishing homes and confiscating land in the Palestinian areas is very common. Over and above all, you already have a population of around 2 million living under siege in Gaza. Although you claim to have withdrawn from Gaza, you continue to control its borders, land, sea, and sky. You claim to have the most moral army in the world, yet your soldiers raid homes at night and get children out of their beds. You already have 350 children in your jails and 6,500 men and women, many of whom are under administrative detention without charges or trial, and around 1,000 of them are sick. You claim to be the only democracy in the region, yet you have two sets of laws for your own citizens, and you deny entry to anybody, including Jews and even rabbis who do not agree with your policies. This is certainly not a democracy. Over and above all, you silence voices of dissent in your own country and you imprison young people who do not wish to serve in the army. You claim your hand is stretched out for peace, yet every day your armed settlers are grabbing new areas with the protection of your army. Barak's general offer, with which you brainwash the world and your citizens amount only to a little over 15% of historic Palestine instead of the 22% on which the Palestinians were willing. He's talking about uh, the offer after the Oslo Agreement. Were willing to establish their own state after the Oslo Agreement. You certainly do not want peace and you want to be left in peace without being held accountable to any of the violations of human rights or international law. Of course, you can count on President Trump and his representative in the UN, Nikki Haley, I don't know why she mentioned it here, but I can see, <laughs> to cover your back so as to get away with these violations. No wonder you are feeling on top of the world as you are celebrating 70 years of independence while we celebrate 70 years of our Nakba. So this is the end of her note, and um, I thought it was very appropriate to read it. Uh, Sami Khouri is an activist from Jerusalem. She's 85 years old mm. and still uh, going strong. And I want to end my uh, uh, presentation by referring to the manner in which this whole debate about commemoration uh, engulfs and overshadows the whole debate about what's left of the Palestinian issue. 
because as I hear it, the remaining debate is way out of context and it addresses the whole question of one state, two states, framing, and where do we go from here? And the issue of, it's an issue of form. And that issue of form is undermined by the current realities which has um, sidelined, marginalized the question of Palestine. And thanks to President Trump has been revived again recently through the issue of the embassy. But what is, um, I find, uh, uh, bewildering is that this question of one state, two state debate totally ignores the current situation where the actual condition on the ground is the existence of one state, one state only. There is already. We have arrived there. We are already in living in the condition of one hegemonic state, which is the state of Israel, uh, uh, framing a rump statelet that was created uh, by the Oslo Agreement, the Palestinian Authority, just totally helpless to do anything and uh, uh, fragmented between the enclave in Gaza, which is totally surrounded by Israel, and the uh, West Bank, which is segmented by Israel again and being invaded daily by land settlement and settlers. So what we should do, and I hope the, the panel will do uh, today and later on, uh, I will be finished, mm -hmm. is address this condition of uh, hegemony of the state of Israel and how the uh, dynamics of the political situation in the current Middle East can uh, confront this uh, exclusive domain for uh, one state sovereignty, and thank you. So I want to begin also by thanking John Tierman and Anat Bilecki for putting this together. It is certainly a, a sign of optimism that I hope uh, none of us succeed in undermining uh, totally. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, continue with uh, some of the thoughts that <coughs> uh, Salim has presented. Um, but let me continue in a slightly different way. In 2011, uh, Fawaz Trabulsi, who is a Lebanese historian, a uh, political analyst, uh, prof at LAU and AUB, and uh, frequent um, spokesman on all of these issues, uh, wrote an article called Does Guilt Matter? It was presented at a conference in Bonn having to do with the Lebanese Civil War. And in the course of that very, very interesting essay, he spoke about, he wrote about <coughs> a number of things, but one of them was the question of memory and the role of memory uh, and reconciliation. And he asked the question, uh, what's the purpose of remembering? And his answer was briefly uh, to avoid what just happened. In, a, in other words, you want to remember the, the Civil War. Uh, you want to hear all the memories of, of the Civil War to uh, assure that it doesn't happen again in the same way. In the process of remembering, you not only listen to each other, but you do away with certain myths uh, that are perpetuated about the event. But that it doesn't end there. So as far as he's concerned, the purpose of memory is also to pave the way for acknowledging the past. And acknowledging the past suggests not necessarily approving it, but recognizing the nature of the past and how it's perceived by participants with the hope <clears throat> that this in turn allows for reconciliation, which is in uh, the, the end goal that he speaks about. Well, when I read that, <clears throat> it seemed to me that it was very apropos of uh, the uh, position of the US and the history that, that uh, I have been looking at. Because I often ask myself, <clears throat> and I did so in preparing for today's remarks, does history really matter? Uh, does it matter to 
<coughs> prevent all, <coughs> sorry, to present all of this material uh, <coughs> to you or an abridged version of it. <coughs> <coughs> and the answer is that it matters if you think that in some way it paves the way for changing not only the perception of the present, but the future. <coughs> so although, <coughs> sorry, although we are consigned to talking about the past, it seems to me that we here are really uh, talking in disguise about what we would like to see for a different future. <coughs> but this, <coughs> this is related to uh, US, uh, the uh, origins of US policy in uh, Palestine and Israel in a very special way. The remarks I'm going to make and the work that I've done is based on uh, US, US sources, uh, available US sources, declassified US sources, US sources that are available in large part online. They're so available that you wonder at the effort it takes not to see them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that is one of the things I've been curious about. I didn't do any remote sensing. I got no special permissions. Uh, for declassified material, I looked at everything that was already classified and was surprised uh, that there was nobody around me looking at the same material. What did I find? <coughs> well, what I, <coughs> what I found was that the US, going back to 48, uh, you, can, you should begin earlier. I began a, a recent study in the period 45 to 49, but in the, certainly the period between partition and uh, the armistice talks of 1949, uh, the U.S. kept focusing, by the U.S. I mean the Truman administration and its various officials, who differed certainly among themselves, kept focusing on three issues <clears throat> that they saw as absolutely essential to any resolution of the conflict. This was expressed uh, before May 48 and certainly after, and the three issues were the definition of boundaries, the um, situation of the Palestinian refugees, and the internationalization of Jerusalem. Those three issues, of course, were repeated in the uh, December uh, 11, 1949, uh, 1948 um, uh, UN Resolution 194, which assumed uh, great importance. What's very, um, it seems to me, under-examined and little recognized or appreciated was the extent to which U.S. officials, those on the ground, consuls who were in Jerusalem and throughout uh, Palestine and later Israel, uh, as well as U.S. the assortment of U.S. officials, including those at the U.N. and those immediately in Truman's circle, who were by no means all in accord. Nonetheless, they were in agreement that these three issues were key and of the three issues, the situation of the Palestinian refugees absolutely took first place. There's no subject that was more um, excavated, examined, uh, uh, considered, uh, discussed than the question of the uh, origin of the Palestinian refugee question, uh, its nature, its possible future of the people who were very adamant on this subject was George Marshall, Secretary of State. Um, and uh, I would say his successors. By talking about the origin of it, uh, it's also important to know that these same US officials, and I'd be happy to add others, uh, Mark Etheridge is an important figure at the Palestine uh, Conciliation Commission, were also insistent on recognizing Israeli responsibility. Uh, that was an issue that was repeatedly hammered at. So uh, my sense is, if this is so, if this was so important, if these the pages of these subjects were so clearly uh, unambiguous, why have they been ignored? And would it matter to remember them? So as I said earlier, we remember to, it would be important to remember them first of all to set the present record straight. So if you uh, remember Roger Cohen's uh, article uh, on the op-ed page of the New York Times two days ago, uh, which is a very interesting article, but he has a reference to 1948 and the refugee situation, which is simply the Israeli uh, position on, on this subject. It doesn't fit what uh, neither what the U.S. or what um, Israel knew as well what was ongoing. Why are we so tolerant with this uh, inaccuracy and others? 
Um, in part, I assume that it, not just to remember, but to know with some degree of confidence what policies were allows those who are so informed to demand a change, or at least demand an explanation, or at least be able to respond to policies and their consequences as they confront them. Uh, so from that point of view, remembering and knowing is, uh, is, uh, it is not equivalent to power, but uh, it is a, a knowledge that certainly allows uh, the empowering of, of, uh, of individuals. Now, I have to say also that uh, the sources I'm using that I have used, Foreign Relations of the US, those are the ones that are so easily accessible. You can find them on your computer right now. Just go FRUS. Uh, 1948 slash part two, part two is important. That's all 1948, you'll have it all there and I won't see you ever again because you'll be, <laughs> you'll be, you'll be drowning in it, but you'll be surprised at how much, uh, how much there is. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the question remains, why, uh, why has this been uh, so consistently ignored? Not only by ordinary, ordinary people who are interested in history, but also by academics. Uh, not to say people who are in politics. I don't assume that everybody has a spare, you know, 24 hours to, uh, you know, leave their job and simply immerse themselves in uh, this kind of issue. But for those who are who claim interest, or for those who claim to speak with some authority, uh, it is uh, bizarre, not to say shameful, that they don't know this history, especially if they came to speak. Uh, on behalf of, uh, of Washington. The question is why this happens. It's really not a mystery because it forces us to really confront another issue. In whose interest is it to forget? When you talk about forgetting, forgetting is a mysterious thing. You only forget what it is you know or you knew. So I'm not talking about amnesia. I'm talking about a deliberate forgetting. Uh, if you choose to forget, it means that you have um, found some uh, comfort or some uh, dimension of uh, satisfaction in uh, uh, deciding to put aside uh, an issue uh, of a certain importance. But it is a deliberate, uh, it is a deliberate <coughs> act. I'm not suggesting uh, uh, intentionality is equivalent to evil here. I'm simply saying it's not meaningless. So let me just uh, continue with one, uh, one more item here. So my, my initial, um, the initial point I want to bring to your attention is that U.S. policy in 1948 really is uh, absolutely essential, I think, to understand the, the current root of the problem. The similarities are very, very striking, but they're striking in more ways than one. On the subject of internationalization of Jerusalem, there is absolutely no difference with the uh, uh, position that um, uh, Salim uh, described or uh, had uh, his, uh, the, the letters spoke to, uh, there was a strong feeling that there was no question that the international, internationalization of Jerusalem was not only part of UN resolutions, but was essentially desirable for political reasons for those involved. Having said all this, May 1948, Israel uh, declares its independence within a matter of moments, as it were, uh, symbolically, the U.S. recognizes the, the new state of Israel. By July uh, 48, and within a year, between May 48 and May 49, the position of the U.S. changes. It changes in the following way. The record is there. The record on refugees is unchanged. However, key people, Philip Jessup, uh, for one, Marshall himself, conclude that, Atchison, who succeeded, conclude that this is a very impressive country. It has an amazing military. Uh, its militia got away with expanding beyond the borders of 181, Resolution 181. How did they do that? Mm, quite impressive. Uh, what's our situation? So here comes something important that I didn't mention. To understand the perception of, uh, by the US of the Palestinian situation, you have to view the whole context of US policy. And as uh, Jessup said in one of his remarks, if it wasn't for U.S. economic interest in the region, our policy would probably have differed. U.S. policy in the region meant what after World War II? Protecting access to oil. 
the whole Middle East is perceived as, yes, under British uh, mandate, under French mandate, which ended earlier than the British, a man a British mandate in Palestine and uh, protectorate in, in, uh, in Egypt. But for the US, the question is how to guarantee access to oil in Saudi Arabia. Uh, ma many people uh, claim that uh, the whole U.S. position on Palestine was really of uh, the U.S. was hostile to partition, hostile initially to statehood because it worried about uh, the effect of the oil come, the effect of uh, Saudi Arabia, um, the effect of such decisions on oil um, uh, holding countries, not on the oil, and on the oil producers. But the truth was that they didn't suffer uh, at all. Uh, I'll be happy to pursue that if, if somebody would like to. In any case, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, the, the uh, Air Force, the Navy, the, in 1949, uh, in succeeding uh, statements, uh, assessments more accurately, concluded that it was very desirable to appreciate more fully and more accurately the potential utility of this new state it had an impressive military. Above all, its location was exemplary from the point of view of US interests. And it was very desirable to make sure that its orientation was in the direction of the US rather than the Soviet Union. Having said all of that, uh, it followed that uh, to assure Israeli compliance with this new outlook, it was preferable to diminish the pressure on the question of refugees, to diminish all the pressure that the US was applying, for example, both, uh, especially at Lausanne. The result was, of course, that the US representative, Mark Etheridge, decided he wanted to have none of it, and he left, he resigned. But that was one individual protest, there were others. But the fundamental shift was to remain. There, this was not accompanied by sale of arms or immediately by uh, provision of uh, financing of, of any kind, but it was a very decisive move. It, it is expressed with utter clarity in, a US, uh, in the U.S. documents. So I want to end with that because um, I suppose my point then is that it's not only essential to remember the nature and the origin of U.S. policy and its position with respect to these three issues, refugees, boundaries, and uh, Jerusalem, but also to appreciate how that position shifted and why. In other words, it shifted as a result of a calculation of interests uh, and potential profit. And I believe those calculations remain many years later in a different form and in a different world. Thank you. I also want to thank um, uh, Anna Pilecki and uh, John Terman for organizing this meeting. This is a terrific uh, meeting, and I'm honored to be here. I got in my head, uh, the, from I think from a knot, that the topic of this panel was how we got here. I notice when I look at the um, at the program, it's uh, we're more broadly invited to look back. But um, my remarks are directed specifically at the question of how we got here. Here being. Uh, a bitter, unresolved conflict that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Uh, how, did, how did that happen? Uh, were there forks in the road uh, or um, uh, alternative uh, policies or uh, accidents even that could have uh, uh, brought this conflict to some kind of better place or, or resolution earlier? Uh, what were those forks in the road? What were the choices? Uh, and what different choices might have been made that would have led to something better? Um, uh, and I'm going to make three propositions about that. Uh, before I do, I'll just say also, it's some, sometimes it helps understand uh, someone's analysis of the past if you know what uh, policies or pro, uh, approaches will work today and what uh, the analyst thinks is possible today. I'm basically a two-state guy uh, in two senses. I, I think that a two-state solution remains feasible if the preconditions for it are created. Uh, it remains feasible economically and demographically and politically. And I also think it is the only feasible solution. Uh, I do not think the alternatives to a two-state solution are uh, workable. Uh, the, uh, a, a single uh, uh, secular democratic state, I don't think, I think it has greater problems than a two-state solution. 
and I think Israeli empire uh, in the short run is feasible, but in the long run will be very costly and, and end badly. Uh, and I also think only one two-state solution is feasible. It's a very narrow set of parameters. If you get very far off of those parameters, um, you, uh, you can't get an agreement. So we're talking about a very specific two-state solution, essentially something that can be um, understood by the participants to be full withdrawal for full peace. Um, but that said, what are my three propositions about how we got here? Um, let me just sum them up and then go through them in detail. Uh, proposition one is that extremists on both sides got us here, uh, that the two societies have been for some time ready for peace. And, um, uh, and this is not, in other words, a two societies in collision problem. It's a two extremist movements that have too much power problem. Second um, proposition is that uh, false conflict narratives got here. Irene was talking earlier about narratives and their importance. And uh, my uh, uh, view of conflict in general is that uh, narratives matter a lot. And bad narratives uh, can cause a lot of harm. And narratives are uh, fungible and uh, taffy-like and can be changed. Uh, and uh, when, you're, when you're stuck with bad narratives that are, shall we say, conflict uh, feeding, uh, you're going to have a tough time resolving conflict. Uh, but on the optimistic side, much can be done to, um, uh, to deal with bad narratives if, if there's the will and, and the thought to do it. My sort of archetypal you know, case I would recommend people look at is Western Europe since both Western Europe since 1870 to 45, which is a story of disastrous narratives causing uh, all kinds of horrible things. Uh, Europe wallowed in hyper-nationalist narratives, nationalist narratives that um, overgloried their own civilizations and blamed others for all troubles, uh, each nation possessing its own you know, self-exculpating and other blackening narrative. Uh, and then since 45, some kind of miracle has occurred in Europe. We now have a commonization of narratives. It's quite an astonishing event. It's not much commented on, but it's, it, Europe has, has transformed its historical narratives to the point where all of Western Europe pretty much agrees in the same past uh, and agrees, therefore, on who were the main perps in the past, who, did, who caused the wars, who did the trouble. And for my money, this is a key reason why war is now unthinkable in Western Europe. People point to the EU and economics and the American military presence and so on. Uh, I think they also should uh, consider the role of the commonization of narratives in Western Europe, which I think has played a key role there. And applying that sort of analysis to the Middle East, uh, the Middle East has not undergone that, uh, but it could. And so I'll say some things about how uh, the combat narratives, what I'm calling on both sides, um, have caused trouble and how they could be changed. And specifically, my argument is you have basically victim narratives on both sides that both don't blame the real perp. Uh, and that's a real recipe for trouble. When, when something terrible's happened, people have been hurt, you need to have a narrative that accurately defines who the perp is and puts the blame on that perp. And in both cases, Palestinian and Israeli narrative, the, the, the perp isn't blamed. And who is the perp? The perp is the Christian West. Um, the uh, uh, third point I want to make is that suboptimal political strategies by both sides have um, led to bad results and had uh, strategy been better chosen, uh, we might have uh, gotten much better results on the Palestinian side. And I'm mainly focusing here on American, uh, um, shall we say, friends of Israel, but friends of peace. Uh, I'm not going to comment too much about the uh, uh, you know, mistakes by the Israeli two-state people, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about Palestinian national strategy and two mistakes, I think, that have been made, or shall we say two uh, alternative policies that would have worked better, and then talk about the American uh, discourse about peace. So about the uh, extremists versus the societies, um, I'll just be quick about it. I think that uh, when you look at the um, broad public views among both uh, Israelis and uh, Palestinians, the two societies are essentially, over the past uh, 30 years, have converged on uh, willingness to make peace on uh, essentially the same terms. The polling done by Khalil Shakaki's institute um, since uh, 2004, he's done a series of polls in which he uh, um, uh, interrogates the respondents in some depth about how they would feel about uh, specific uh, settlement terms on the, on the five big issues, on, on borders, on security, on Jerusalem, on refugees, on uh, Palestinian state sovereignty, and then adds it all up and says, what would you, uh, would you vote thumbs up or thumbs down on a settlement that um, uh, uh, fit the requirements we just laid out. And the basic, the, the picture, the, the, the agreement that they're being asked to judge is essentially a full withdrawal for full peace um, uh, settlement formula. 
uh, slightly more pro, uh, is, uh, pro-Palestinian, I would say, than the Clinton plan or uh, the other uh, major plans, the ILO and the Sable plan and other plans. But it's basically the, the plan you're all familiar with. And uh, consistently since 2004, we've seen um, the Palestinian community uh, thumbs upping it by 45 or 50 percent, and the Israeli community thumbs upping it by 60 to 65 percent. And to me, the big news here is that these communities are agreeing on the same peace formula without being led there by their leaders. Uh, their, their leaders are not telling them, hey, you know, let's do this. Let's sell it. Let's, uh, th- th- this is good. Let's, let's go here. The communities are, are already there, and I think with leadership, they would be pulled further in that direction. Now, of course, if there was a settlement on these terms, of course, the spoilers will play a huge role. There are going to be people who want to use violence to break things up and so on and so forth. But to me, the basic disposition of the, if one way to put this is, if the two secular movements who were fighting each other in 48 were still driving the bus, I believe that peace would be at hand. They could make peace with each other. The real problem is the rise of religious extremism on both sides. The conflict has become religified, um, and uh, that's the big news. And uh, the extremists on both sides who reject two states um, are uh, driving the bus, even though they are not socially dominant. And, and the big puzzle is how to undo that, or how to, how to shall we say, sideline those who uh, want a, he- a hegemony of their own side as the solution. Um, uh, and we're not good at that, by the way. We're talking about how do you moderate extreme movements. I keep telling dis- my, my, my students that we need a dissertation on uh, moderationology, on how does, how does a movement that has large aims or uh, extreme tactics, whatever, how does it uh, come to adopt uh, something more moderate? Social science hasn't got a good answer to that. Um, the uh, second point is uh, about narratives and uh, how narratives got us here also. And my... Uh, my uh, uh, sort of summary of it all is that uh, how, how did this conflict arise? Who is the perp? I said it was the Christian West. Um, essentially, to me, the taproot of the conflict is the um, oppression of the Jewish minority in Europe for the last thousand years, uh, during which uh, the Jewish minority was uh, subjected to um, uh, uh, massacres and ghettoization and uh, uh, ultimately the Holocaust. And uh, this led to a uh, a movement of uh, separation in the 19th century, uh, which was essentially a movement of refuge to escape from what was an intolerable political situation, social situation in Europe. Um, and, and who was behind all of this? My view is it was essentially a project of organized Christianity. I'm very fond of this book by Daniel Kurtzer on uh, the, pa- the popes against the Jews. And I'm very fond also of uh, Jim Carroll's book, uh, which is a magnificent history of the wrongs of the Christian church against the Jewish people down through the ages. If you're familiar with this book, it's called um, um, Constantine's Sword. It's a terrific history. Um, This is not the narrative of either party in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Neither neither the Arabs nor nor the Israelis like this narrative. They don't like the idea of sort of assigning prime blame to um, uh, the Christian West. Uh, There there are some... it's, It's a... You know, I, the best framing of it I can think of is Isaac Deutscher, who years ago uh, said, what's going on between Arabs and, 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 and uh, Israelis? It's, it's like a, uh, a man in a house on fire who saves himself by jumping out the window and landing on uh, the pedestrian outside and killing him. And I would put an extra twist on it, which is that somebody lit that fire. That wasn't an accident. The Christian West lit the fire. And so this guy isn't uh, responding to some misfortune. He's responding to a crime. Uh, committed by the Christian Western society. Uh, but th- this is not a popular narrative. The Israelis have, I think, I'm interpreting here, uh, been uncomfortable with it because it involves kicking their patrons in the shins. Their chief patrons have been, since the beginning, Western powers, the British back in the day, and then the French in the 50s, and the United States today. And it's uncomfortable to say, hey, be our ally, stand by us always, and by the way, you guys are criminals. It's just it's an awkward narrative. And it also, I think many Israelis find it an undignified narrative. There was a lot of pushback in Israel uh, when Obama gave his uh, Cairo speech, and he wasn't, he didn't talk much at length about where the conflict came from, but he was basically uh, uh, interpreting the past the way I'm doing it here, and uh, it was not welcomed by the Israelis. And the Palestinian narrative also, they are un, uh, uncomfortable, they have been, shall we say, uncomfortable with a narrative that focuses on um, the uh, 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 wrongs of the Christian West against the Jew, Jewish people, um, because it seems to justify Zionism. It, 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 it 
paint Zionism instead of being a predatory movement with, uh, with, that has no excuse and was adopted for you know, reasons that are illegitimate, it, it grants some legitimacy to Zionism because we all understand that anyone whose life is threatened and whose community faces destruction has to do um, desperate things to save your, your family, your kids, and your, and your friends. And that a movement of refuge has more legitimacy than a, you know, a simple predatory uh, uh, imperial movement. Um, now, my view is that both of these communities, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians, I understand you know, th their resistance to the true narrative is, is understandable, but both of them are basically combat narratives. In other words, when, you're, uh, when your frame, prime focus is beating the other guys, OK, you should adopt narratives like this, because um, uh, that'll mobilize your people and mobilize uh, you know, the rest of the world to support you. But both of these narratives, in my opinion, are obsolete in the sense that the prime problem now for both sides is making peace. And uh, both sides should realize that, uh, that um, uh, they, uh, telling, telling what truly happened here, and blaming the true perp, the, the Christian West, has two advantages. One, it's true. And number two, uh, we, the, both parties now need to um, reconcile, not, not to fight each other. And I'm not saying that adopting new narratives that are more, shall we say, a third party blaming, not blaming the other side, would be a, a silver bullet, but it would be a big improvement. Uh, over what we now have. And the ultimate objective should be to achieve what's been done in Western Europe, where you'd have basically both sides agreeing on uh, the same past, taking responsibility for their own actions. And as I said, there's this third twist, which is if the prime blame were put where it belongs, it could be lifted from the main opponent. Each side could put less blame on their opponent and put more blame where it belongs on, on the Christian West. Um, and uh, I think this is why talk about this? It's because narratives can be changed, as I said. We saw the West European narratives really remade after World War II by, there was a, t a twin political movement that remade uh, Europe's narratives. Uh, the uh, Eckert Institute in Braunschweig uh, had a project of, uh, of commonizing the history texts that were used throughout the European schools, and UNESCO also did. This didn't happen by accident, and to me, fine, learn lessons from that. Third, um, uh, proposition that about strategies and how political strategies Different ones uh, might have worked better, might have brought better results. When we talk about the Palestinians, um, I'll just say very quickly, I, I've long held the view that if the Palestinian nation had managed somehow to pursue a, non a uh, strategy of nonviolence along the lines of what the Dr. King movement did in the United States, uh, Gandhi did in India, um, uh, uh, you name other movements that were quasi nonviolent, that it, this would have been effective. And, uh, uh, and so there's a sort of big fork in the road. What was the right instrument to use to coerce or, or persuade others to grant Palestinian wishes? Um, I think a nonviolent strategy would have worked better, mainly because, to me, the outside world plays a huge role in this conflict. Um, and uh, the, the, the rest of the world, especially the United States, is a long pole in the tent. And um, it could be appealed to by uh, a strategy essentially aimed at street theater, of the kind that I'm a big fan of Dr. King and, and of his movement. I think he was a genius. And uh, uh, lessons could have been learned from how he dealt with a, an equally tough question, white racism. How did he ever manage to engineer street theater that really did bring some change in American white, white thinking? Um, what could be learned? And I'm sure many people, uh, I, I know most people don't agree with me on this, but I'll put that forward as a proposition. And the second is, um, to uh, have a quote, I'm using a phrase here, go to the Knesset. Um, uh, if the Palestinian movement, uh, well, let's just say, I think that um, Sadat's stroke in 1977 of say, announcing he wanted to uh, go to Jerusalem and speak to the Knesset and then doing it, it, uh, it, tra it changed Israeli uh, um, uh, images of uh, Egyptian intentions a lot. It really, it, it shook loose uh, the way uh, Israelis thought about um, the feasibility of, uh, of uh, peace with Egypt and, and uh, the question of whether Egypt was a partner for peace or not. And, uh, uh, the, but the Palestinian movement has not made a project of, uh, shall we say, going to the Knesset or using its interactions with, um, uh, certainly not with Americans. I mean, there's a two, si two sides to this. One is, what about actually you know, approaching the Israelis differently? OK, fine. I'm really talking about approaching the American friends of Israel differently. Um, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Palestinians have not used negotiation. They've treated negotiations as transactional 
but we'll, we'll, we won't make offers until you make offers, and we will only make offers conditional on your willingness to reciprocate. There's a whole second way of thinking of negotiations, which is to think of them as a framing exercise in which you reveal your intentions toward the other side in the course of negotiations. And the uh, Palestinian movement has not uh, taken that option. Um, I also think that uh, uh, in terms of American uh, friends of peace, uh, there should have been a wider challenge to Israeli imperial and hawkish ideas by the entire, shall we say, peace movement in the US. And one is there's been a missing challenge to American Christian Zionists. Christian Zionism in the United States is a significant part of the um, uh, problem. Uh, they have a lot of influence in Congress. You don't run into it much here, but if you know what's ticking down in you know, Texas, you know this is a big deal. And they've really gotten a free ride. The Christian Zionists have, I think, a malicious interpretation of scripture. They ought to be called out on it and argued with, and, and they're not. And the second is that there ought to be a stronger um, assessment of uh, Netanyahu's grand strategy. Everyone uh, sort of waves their hands at Netanyahu's approach to Israeli futures. Uh, the man has no strategy. Uh, how can we even debate it with him? Uh, but in, in the end, again, he's not called on. And I think that uh, Netanyahu does not have a, any remotely happy-looking uh, future strategy for Israel. Uh, and and th there's been, again, a real gap in the um, debate uh, because there's been no, uh, shall we say, response to, um, to his uh, policy of uh, essentially status quo forever, which means empire forever. So I'll stop with that. Okay. Thank you. So before we go to questions, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that a question is brief. Um, it is, uh, as we're on the subject of narration, uh, it is interrogative. And uh, that means more than just lexically ending with an inflection upward. It means uh, actually being motivated by curiosity. Uh, it doesn't require speeches. It should be uh, succinct and to the point. We have people to assist at the mic. I would ask if there are students, uh, either MIT or other uh, students uh, in the audience, that we give them priority since this is a university-funded event. Um, and while all that is cooking, um, I guess I'd like to take the advantage of uh, being the moderator to just start with one question, which I think Irene spoke to very directly and both uh, Salim and Steve have touched on which is sort of why is it that we don't hear or see what's out in plain sight? Um, you know, the, there was some inquiry on the ground before Resolution 181 that indicated neither side wanted to see partition. Uh, today, you know, we have Israeli politicians openly proclaiming annexation, and yet this seems not to enter into the conversation very much. People tend, I think, to repeat established positions as though none of this was on the record. So I'm sort of curious about what we choose not to hear and not to see. And I know that Irene spoke to it most directly, but I'd, I'd like to start with that question and people can address it, all three of you, in whatever way you want. Um, and then we'll go to the audience's questions. So um, if we could start there. <clears throat> well, I would say that it's not an accident that certain issues are uh, ignored. Uh, one of my points was that it's essential to ask, and I think I would uh, put this to uh, Steve Van Ever as well, in whose interests are policies pursued? Uh, we haven't talked about the role of the media, but uh, there's a question of dissemination of policies, dissemination of narratives, although I have developed an allergy to the word, I confess, but uh, so be it. Um, it. Policies are not invented uh, for uh, out, of, out of the blue. You, you have to look into, and my field is not policy, but policy making, it's not a science, it's not an art, it's certainly a corrupt form of, uh, of behavior, of maneuvering power, but uh, it's essential to ask in whose interest certain uh, views are uh, ignored and others are disseminated. Um, so I think that uh, uh, one of the issues that I've not discussed is what are the risks of opening this door? Well, the risks are that uh, you're going, you, 
I mean, we would have mm -hmm. to say, look, uh, American policy uh, is responsible for uh, deliberately um, uh, lowering the importance of the refugee problem in a fashion that they understood would ultimately destroy the, destroy the issue. There was a deliberate attempt to depoliticize it. What does that mean? Render it a refugee question. Right? question. Um, so these are some of the things that, that one has to look at. So what are, what are the risks? Because I say the risk, in the same way that the US has uh, uh, demonstrated great aversion to Palestinians bringing the uh, Palestinian question to the UN at different points. Um, yes, they're right to be afraid of it and to oppose it because it means reopening this Pandora's box and looking at how things began and how things uh, be became what they are today. And to do that means that you assign responsibility, you assign blame, you assign a different order of questions. Are people prepared to do that? Not if they feel that they have a stake in the way things are. It may be an emotional stake, but I'm suggesting it's something more than that. Tony, if you want to comment? Yes, I, I fully agree. I think uh, part of the blame, however, for the non-implementation of 181 after the Madrid Peace Conference should lie also with the Arabs and with the Palestinians themselves, who agreed to frame the whole issue in terms of not applying 181, but 242, which at that time seemed the most reasonable thing to do. And because they began at such a lower ceiling, they had to eventually, given the balance of uh, powers at the time and the collapse of the Soviet Union, to go lower and lower until they got to Oslo. So Oslo became the, f the fading expression of what remained of 181. Want to speak That's okay. To those yeah. okay. Um, okay. All right. I think we're now ready um, for our first question. Okay. Uh, we we have, are wanting uh, people to go yeah. because this is being recorded and filmed to the microphones, please, if you um, have a question. We actually have the microphones moving around Oprah style at this point. Um, so we have a questioner here. Uh, your okay. name, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Abraham Shalom. I'm a student here at MIT. Um, I wanted to know uh, if the de like, if tomorrow a deal were reached between Israel and the Palestinians, do you feel that the Palestinian organizations, uh, that the PLO will be able to enforce such a deal? And uh, taking this into account, what would you, if you were Netanyahu or Israel, what would be your next steps? I, are I you directing this at the whole panel? Or? The uh, sure. I, I mean, at whoever would want to answer, it would be a very Thank you. Can, can you clarify can you the question? Can you clarify what the question is? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if there were peace tomorrow or there yes. were a deal on the table, could the PLO? Would the PLO have, does the PLO have, have control and authority over the population? Like, if there were a deal, would they be able to enforce it? Who's going to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only my, the my, moderator. We're going to let the experts answer this or not answer it. I mean, my answer is yes. I mean, I think a key problem, the key problem in uh, you know, implementing a peace deal would be spoilers, as I was saying, meaning folks who want to break the deal up and who would use force to do it. But to me, in the end, um, if you're serious about police presence and serious about intelligence gathering, uh, this is a problem that has a solution. And uh, furthermore, if both parties agree to, shall we say, not insist on 100% perfection in the policing of spoilers and not, not sort of play their game by um, uh, you know, taking the first incident of spoiling as a reason to break the agreement. I mean, I think, I think this, this could be done. If you look at successful peace agreements in the past, how many, or should we say, how often has it happened that spoilers have managed to wreck peace agreements? It, it's happened, but not, not often and not against a sort of concerted effort by elites on both sides who are determined to make sure the peace sticks once it's made. It's a great question. It is the thing I worry about the most, though, in terms of aftermath to a peace settlement. No, but the, the, the issue is what is the package being offered? Oh, if the proposal is to have a peace agreement based on Neftali Bennett's vision mm -hmm. of reducing the West Bank to area A and B, 
then the, no power, PLO or other, can uh, mobilize or allow the population to accept it. Uh, the state of Israel cannot impose a deal I, at the moment, which I think is a just deal, which is returned to the 47 uh, partition plan. So the question is, what is the, the package that's being proposed? My view on that is the only package that will work is something that can be sold as full withdrawal for full peace. I think on the Palestinian side, the narrative is basically a, le a leader has to be able to look hit, hit, uh, the, the, the people in the eye and say, we got what Sadat got, and we got what Hussein got, meaning something that can be described as full withdrawal for full peace. It won't really be that because there will be land swaps, and the land swaps are going to be unfair, and the land that the Palestinians wound up with would be inferior to the land that the Israelis have taken near Jerusalem and so on and so forth. But it could be presented that way, and, and without, it would, you know, a proposal that could pass the giggle test. Anything outside those parameters will not fly. I agree with you. will never be accepted. Let's, go, let's continue. Um, okay, there are other questions if we're ready to move forward. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm a PhD candidate in applied mathematics at MIT. So this is not my area of ex expertise. I'm just uh, here as an enthusiast. So my question is, uh, what role do media, especially US domestic media, play in shaping the public opinions of uh, um, Americans on this issue? And as non-expert, how should we pick and choose different sources uh, in order to develop a more informed, less biased view on, on the issue? Thank you. Well, it's a great question uh, to, uh, to ask. It's not so easy to answer. Uh, the media obviously has an enormous role in shaping opinion and what we know and uh, what it is that we don't know. So we have to apply pressure or we have to uh, diversify the number of sources that, that are available. Uh, for those of you who've looked closely into major, uh, not social media, but the press, uh, you know how difficult that is and what kind of internal struggles go on. I think that there is a change at the present time. I think that coverage is beginning to open up. Uh, I've been interested, perhaps you have too, in the coverage on, of the New York Times on Gaza. Uh, it depends who's writing the articles, and you can tell real differences. There are often adjectives that are used to uh, suggest qualifications. Uh, X number of Palestinians were killed as uh, Palestinians claim. A phrase like that is enough to, to undermine the, uh, the, the information. Nonetheless, uh, there is more information that is being uh, that is being presented. Um, so I think that public support for that, in the form of uh, letters and expressions of, of uh, support, uh, I think there's evidence of movement uh, all over the country in many in many areas. Uh, besides the press, there are organizations that have been created. The Jewish Voices for Peace uh, is, uh, I think, an important organization that has uh, changed. Um, open the doors for, for uh, many people to participate. Uh, universities are under great pressure to uh, contain uh, supporters, for example, of, B of BDS, but that's become a public issue now, and that's good. In other words, you can mobilize opinion. So uh, I think first to acknowledge the importance of the issue you raise, I think the, the media is very, very important. Uh, I don't believe that the media makes policy. But I think that the role of the media in enforcing a certain line of policy is uh, is key, um, and uh, every every effort that we can make to contest that and to call for greater diversity would be uh, very desirable. Go on. Anyone else? Well, you spoke more than this is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think then we have one over here. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, MIT alumni, also I'm at Tokyo Renewable Institute. My question is very simple. Uh, maybe the answer is very difficult. I don't know. Uh, why was it that in 2000, uh, Yasser Arafat was unable to uh, swallow the agreement at the, at the Camp David Accords? Um, any explanation would be appreciated. No, it was 2000 when Clinton was president. When Clinton was leaving office, he almost had to deal with Iraq. You want me to, I'll comment on what I think happened. I think that, the, uh, that we, 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 
The parties came very close to making peace at Taba. Uh, and I think that uh, um, Arafat, this is my interpretation based on lots of fragments of data, uh, didn't get it. He did not understand two things when he was at Taba. This is January. He, he, they go to Taba you know, a few days after New Year's, and they've got about two weeks. And January 20th, Clinton is going to leave the White House. And on February 5th or so, there's going to be an Israeli election. And uh, Netanyahu is going to win. And he's going to replace Barack. Pardon? Sharon. Yeah, sorry. What am I saying? Uh, Sharon's going to win. And uh, Arafat, uh, I think, thought he had all spring to uh, make a deal and didn't understand that uh, all Americans aren't alike and that Clinton is more inclined to push for peace than his successor, that Bush is going to bring in a bunch of people much less peace inclined, and that uh, Sharon is uh, going to be much less peace inclined than, um, than uh, Barack. And uh, apparently, the things I've heard is that Arafat was still uh, in, in March, you know, two, two, a month and a half later, still trying to get the talks going again, because he assumed that the talks would still be going. So, I, to me, he made a horrifying misjudgment. That's, that's my, my summary. He, he blundered magnificently. Well, I th if I may add, I think um, I agree with you that in Taba, the two sides were very close to make a deal. The blame on Arafat at the time is, uh, is a product of the media, since you asked it. Because what happened was not that the Palestinians rejected a deal. But they were looking at a situation where the impending collapse of the Ehud Barak government was about to happen. And they did not want to engage in a deal which would not be carried by a future Israeli government. So what they agreed on in Taba is to, re, to go back to continue the negotiations after the elections. And this was seen as a rejection of a deal by Arafat, where in fact what happened was that the the result of the deal was preempted by the collapse of the labor government and the coming of uh, Sharon to the state. And this is what happened. Can someone on the panel explain the difference between what was on the table at Camp David and what was on the table at Taba uh, uh, about uh, seven or eight months later? It was the same. Uh, what happened in Taba was they worked out a few more details on refugees, which basically corresponded to the package proposed by uh, President Clinton at the time. And uh, in Taba, uh, the, um, the question of negotiations was or details which were already fleshed out in Camp David. The difference between Taub and Camp David is the impending collapse of the Labour government, which was not yet mm. clear in, uh, in Camp David. I haven't read your work on this, and I defer to you because you're closer to the subject. But um, th This is controversial. My student, Jeremy Pressman, wrote what I thought was the best article on Camp David and Taub. And he said that the Taub deal, um, the, thing on the, the deal on the table at Taub was significantly more generous to the Palestinians than what was on the table during the summer at Cape De Camp David, that um, basically Barack came into Camp David with a really, uh, shall we say, unrealistic view of what he could persuade the Palestinians to concede. And I'm dimly recalling the first territorial uh, uh, breakdown was uh, something like only you know, the, was it 88% of historic Palestine was going to wind up as a Palestinian state. 12% would remain with Israel. It wouldn't look, didn't look remotely like it, full withdrawal. It, it, it of the occupied territories. Sorry. Well, I'm other way around, other way other, around. Other way around. Other way around. But anyway, I thought that the territorial discussion moved quite a distance toward mm -hmm. something that looked more like full withdrawal. But um, we can check footnotes later. I'm just quoting my student, Jeremy. What, what was being discussed was one-fifth of the historic Palestine. Right. Mm -hmm. And the land swap involved whether it will be 2% or 3% of that area. I, I thought that the summer discussion was much less generous than that, mm. but I could be wrong. Um, my name is David Rosenberg, and with um, great difficulty, I'm going to resist trying to correct anything I've heard and merely ask a question. Uh, and the Thank que you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. 
And the question is, in view of um, the uh, territory of the Mandate for Palestine having been divided and giving 77% to the Arabs in what was Transjordan and is now Jordan, and restrict, pro prohibiting Israel, um, sorry, Jewish immigration to that territory and giving only 23% for the Jews. Um, why did the United States and the West generally not abide by the 1922 treaty and by Article 80 of the um, uh, Charter of the United Nations and um, make sure that at least on that 23%, the Jews had the right to um, settle anywhere and uh, that was to be facilitated by facilitated by the mandatory uh, power. So wh why was that? Uh, I don't want to comment on your history, which I don't entirely recognize, uh, but I would only say this, that in 48, the U.S. was supportive of uh, Abdullah's uh, agreement to uh, take over the uh, Palestinian territory that the Israelis would, would cede, uh, in part because the U.S. was not sympathetic to the idea of a Palestinian state. So this w very early became a, uh, an ideal solution. Marshall was uh, quite happy, apparently, when he heard about this, just at the moment when he was beginning to sympathize with the idea of uh, the U.S. going back to the U.N. Uh, to uh, dismantle, partition, and talk about trusteeship. So when he heard about the secret agreements, uh, the exchanges between Abdullah and various uh, uh, Jewish political figures, he found that uh, encouraging. But uh, there's nothing encouraging about the results. Actually, this question is very interesting because it corresponds to the... Uh, within Zionism, there's a, a historical debate between where is Palestine. And the revisionists always insisted mm. that Palestine included Transjordan. And uh, the today, the uh, historic reversal has come back because there's a lot of Likud mm. people and people on the Israeli right who believe that Jordan is Palestine. Right. And this makes the Jordanian nervous. government very nervous about yeah. the intentions of the current Israeli government. So thank you for bringing it to our attention. I, I think given limited time, we maybe would want to hear the next three questions and so these two and one over here, perhaps, and then people can respond to all or some of them. So why don't we start here and then go to the next two there? Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ori from Harvard. Um, so I'd like to discuss the refugees and two sets of refugees because nobody is really talking about more than a million Jewish refugees after the defensive war that six armies invaded Israel in '48, following the '49. Close to a million refugees were essentially deported from Muslim countries all the way from Morocco to Iran. Most of them came to Israel, and it's account for more than half the Jewish population in Israel. So effectively, it was a population swap. Now, the second refugee uh, mm -hmm. element is that Palestinian objectionism is solidly about refugees. So even at 2008, not just 2000, 2001 negotiation with Olmert and Abu Mazen, uh, Abbas, um, there was also another Palestinian rejection. And last month, uh, Salam Fayyad gave a talk at HKS and asked them if there is the same resolution, meaning a population, a territory swap, removing of settlements, East Jerusalem for Palestine, will there be a resolution? He said no, and the main reason was the Palestinian refugees and the right of return. So I'd like your views on the Jewish refugees, on the Palestinian refugees. <clears throat> we have the next two questions. I'm an MIT alum, uh, where frequently we would try to understand the present by looking at contrafactuals, and maybe uh, specifically for uh, Professor Taramari with the list of horribles that you read. What if, and you talked about the 47 uh, borders, what if when Israel had declared its independence, the five Arab nations hadn't invaded with the thought of wiping all the Jews into the sea, and if that theme has not continued to be enunciated one way or another by major Arab leaders, major Arab organizations like Hamas and, and, and others, would the Weltanschauung of the 
Israelis be different? Would there have been a 67 war? Where does the blame really lie? You spoke to that. I, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. A question just to Irene. Um, I'm glad you've gotten on to the later period, <clears throat> around the time of the Red Scare in the US. And I'm wondering how much, if you've found that the documents you've been studying reflect that, and the fear that somehow Israel as a socialist inclined country is more dangerous um, because of its affinities with the Soviet Union. Did that enter into your reading? Okay, <clears throat> so let me uh, very, very quickly comment on the first. Uh, so again, I'm talking, uh, I'm answering with, uh, within the context of uh, the work that I um, was talking about earlier. Uh, the U.S. was very aware of the situation of Jewish refugees. The Earl Harrison uh, Committee that was uh, sent out by uh, Truman, for example, to look at the situation of Jewish refugees in the American occupied zone of Germany came back with a very uh, harsh report on their conditions, as a result of which uh, the U.S. asked that 100,000 refugees, Jewish refugees, be allowed into Palestine while it was still a British mandate. The result of that was a rejection on the part of the British, a decision to hold um, a, uh, the, the Harrison report was in 45, to hold a series of meetings. Uh, one was the Anglo-American Committee, that was followed by um, other, other developments. To say that the U.S. Would, to say the US uh, was aware of, of, of that issue is something that I want to emphasize. Uh, but there was a lot more discussion than that. Uh, Gordon Merriam, for example, was uh, someone who was very, very active in the uh, division of uh, Near East uh, in the State Department and kept insisting that the refugee situation is an international problem. The, refu the uh, European refugee situation is an international problem. And he also uh, said, uh, uh, okay, what about the uh, advanced industrialized states with the U.S. first? Why haven't they opened their doors? to uh, European refugees, to Jewish refugees in particular. There was a lot of discussion about the nativism and the racism involved in the rejection of uh, refugees, as well as in the uh, indifference to existing quotas that were, that were not filled. There's more to say on that. Um, I'm afraid I don't really uh, agree with the notion of a swap, Jewish refugees for Palestinian refugees. Among other things, by the way, U.S. Uh, officials at the time thought in sheer numbers that the number of Palestinian refugees expelled uh, by, uh, who fled or were expelled by Jewish forces in Israel after 48, the number goes as far as 900,000. That, that is a U.S. figure that is often uh, cited. They claim that that was, of course, much greater and the total of uh, European Jewish refugees who survived the war. It doesn't eliminate the question of the, of the situation of those Jews. As far as the predicament of Jews in Arab countries uh, and uh, the uh, pressure that some uh, uh, felt and, and uh, as a result of which left, an example of Baghdad, Iraq, 1950, that these are important questions. I don't want to sidestep them. They will take a lot longer to, to recognize. But the notion that there is some kind of a swap, no, there is a revenge uh, policy, if you want, that, that's uh, pursued and uh, that's, uh, that's important. Um, on, on the last, last question, uh, Nancy's question, uh, I think the U.S. officials were very concerned about the Stern Gang, which they saw as sympathetic to the Soviet Union. Uh, this was an, ex a, an exaggerated interpretation of what, the stir of what relations were between the Stern Gang and the USSR. But your question is very apt. This issue does come up, not in 1950, but earlier. Uh, so some have interpreted this as a sign that the Cold War really is the explanation for U.S. policy. I never, expect I never accepted that. But the concern about Soviet influence in Eastern, um, Eastern Europe and in the Mediterranean, of course, Look at U.S. intervention in uh, Greece and uh, the uh, concern that uh, the Soviet Union had uh, uh, involvements in uh, Iran, uh, that they sought to uh, shift uh, the uh, uh, orientation of, of, of Israel uh, were, I don't say they were legitimate, they were real concerns. This doesn't equal to um, a McCarthyist 
uh, politics, but I think it, it was a, a factor. Certainly the idea in recognition, discussion of recognition, the, the issues uh, repeatedly came up. Let's do this before the Soviets do it. Let's take advantage of this before the uh, Soviets uh, do it. Israel maintained relations with the, uh, with the Soviet Union, and they, after all, the Russian position on partition and statehood is, very, very, is a very important factor in understanding uh, Israeli sympathy for the USSR. I just want to say a word about refugees. I th this is the first time I hear the number one million mentioned, because the uh, Israeli claim is 800,000. I was on the refugee commission uh, after the Madrid Peace Conference, and I was in a, a group that negotiated with the Israelis the issue of refugees. And it came as an afterthought. The Israelis never raised the issue of a swap. Mm. that uh, our Jews were expelled from the Arab countries and your Palestinians uh, were, ex were expelled or lost their homes. Of course, they did not acknowledge how they lost their homes in 48. That came as an afterthought later. And remember that uh, the Iraqi and Egyptian Jews uh, and later the Moroccans uh, left in reaction of the fate of the Palestinians in the 48 war. Now, that does not justify what happened to them, but uh, what happened was uh, uh, much later mm -hmm. the question of uh, anti-Jewish uh, 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 legislation was enacted in, in Iraq uh, and later in Nasser's Egypt that had nothing to do with the Palestine issue. It had to do with the nationalization of Suez Canal and liquidation of assets by foreign nationals. Uh, so the, the question cannot be equated with that. And number two, which is more important in my view, uh, the bulk of Arab uh, refugees to Israel, that is Jews of Arab uh, country origins, came from Morocco. The, the majority were Moroccans, not Iraqis or Yemenis or Egyptians. Most of the Moroccan Jews were not refugees to Israel. They were immigrants. It's true that in Morocco there was a great deal of agitation against the Jews, but they were not forced to leave. They chose to leave, and many of them uh, kept their citizenship until today, and they often go back to their country of origin, which is certainly not the situation with the Palestinian refugees. So the two issues cannot be equated in that, uh, in that sense. Sorry? About uh, the 50s and peace, making peace in the 50s? No, I'll take it back. Our Arabs had not invaded Israel of Hunt's declaration of independence. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Would the world be different? Would the outlook of the people who had just escaped the oven felt maybe they had some friends after returning after 1,700 years to their land? You think if the <laughs> Arabs had not threatened the state of Israel as it was being formed, the state of Israel would have abided by the condition of the partition plan and accepted to be in a region in which 45% of the population would be Arab, it would be, uh, she, that is a totally unviable situation. The Israeli strategy for expansion was built into its acceptance of the partition plan. It was just tactical. There's no question about it in my mind or in any reasonable historical mind. I could say also, if you read Israeli sources on this period, uh, they're very revealing of uh, the Israeli perception of Arab intentions and, above all, of Arab political and military weakness. Uh, one of the most moving accounts is of the utter weakness, uh, incompetence militarily of uh, the Egyptians uh, by... Uh, I can name a number of different Israelis, but they had a very accurate sense of who their enemies were. 
and they had very little respect for their military prowess. So the notion that they would be driven out. When uh, Eliyahu Epstein, who was a Jewish agency uh, representative uh, in the US, uh, became close to Max Boll and through him eventually met people in the uh, oil sector, uh, they discussed some of these things. Uh, so did Weissman on his trips to the US. Uh, so did uh, uh, Judah Magnus and Nahum Goldman on their trips to the US and to talk with uh, Department of State figures. None of them expressed concern about being driven into the sea. They expressed frustration uh, at the lack of adequate US uh, support, but they, had, they were very, very clear cut on what their long-term intentions were, which were above all to create a state and uh, to accept partition as a transition, transitory period. So uh, your description um, uh, to me is, uh, I, I recognize perhaps where it comes from, but I don't recognize it as a statement of fact. So I think with that, we'll call this panel concluded.